My name's Sasha Peter and I'm joined by Michael Valkanis. To the footballing community, this man needs no introduction. And for those of you who don't know much about football, Michael has, uh, is currently the assistant coach of the Greek national football side. Um, he's had um, numerous stints in Pek Zvol. Um, he, he coached my beloved Melbourne City. Um, he had, a, he had a stints um, all the way from in Adelaide United, from running their youth side, um, all the way to eventually being caretaker. Um, from his playing career as a teenager, um, Michael started uh, his youth career at South Melbourne. He, he, as a 19-year-old, as he, he, he ended up playing for the senior side, a very successful side before moving and having stints in Greece at Iraklis. Uh, and Larissa um, before coming back to Australia uh, in uh, uh, 2002 uh, out at Adelaide City and, and had a long uh, career um, at uh, Adelaide United. So um, he's, he's done it all in terms of uh, his football community. He actually, uh, he, was, uh, he did our country proud. He, he, he managed to, to get a soccer root cap in, in 2006 and also represented um, our uh, under-23 side. So I am super, super excited to be speaking with Michael today. So welcome, Michael Valkanis. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks for a great introduction. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to, to someone like you as well and, and a number of coaches. Uh, it's always great to be able to talk about football. Awesome. Other coaches. So... What, what I want today to be is about your thoughts about leadership, your involvement in the game and, and football in general. And, and a lot, what I'd like to start off is, is what do you think makes a great team? Yeah, great team. Uh, yeah, look, it's interesting because at the moment I'm also, um, I've got a little bit more time than usual with the national team, apart from this month that we're getting into the Nations League and and I've been uh, starting to write a book ever since I left Pegs Vola as well in regards to a coaching process and building a team. And it's, it's interesting when I sit back and I look at uh, the way I probably looked at things as a coach 10 years ago and the way I look at it now. And uh, there's a whole lot of things that have to conspire together and, and come together as a building block to, to make a great team. And one of the most, uh, look, when I was younger, I always thought it was tactics, knowledge, coaching, and it was all about football. And as you get older, you realise it's, it's about people. Mm. It's about people. And that football is our people. And it's about people working together and people coming together for, for one great cause. And, and the, the, the tactics, the type of football, the philosophy that we get uh, entangled with at a younger age as, as we coach and all the knowledge about football and all the training sessions we want to do are just a vehicle of bringing these people together to achieve something great. So uh, to cut a long story short, I, I, because we can speak about this for, for hours and hours, <laughs> yeah, I think what makes a great, a great team is the environment and the people within the environment. And it's not only the players, but it's the staff and how everyone comes together to work together for the, for the greater good and, and to achieve greatness for the team, but also that every individual within that uh, achieves their own goals that they want to achieve within that team. So th that's what I see what makes a really good team. Okay. And so what are the measures that, what are the input measures that you focus on to try and sort of move that needle? Yeah. Okay. I think uh, you've got to spend a lot more time with individuals and with the players and you have to create those relationships within a team, whether it's a club team or a national team. Like I said, it's about people. So you need to spend a lot of time uh, getting to know uh, everyone and it's not necessarily talking about football. So when I was a younger coach, I would have thought it was all about football. And, and I think, you know, and, I, and I'm honest with that. I, I love the game and I, and I love the idea of playing a certain way and, and achieving that style of play out on the park and winning because I was always a, a sort of player. I wanted to win. I wanted to win everything. I want to win a monopoly if I play with the kids. But mm. what you realise is when you get older, to win doesn't necessarily only come from, uh, from making people work harder. It doesn't only come from uh, uh, pushing people more. 
it, it comes from building relationships and letting them know that you really care and letting know, letting every individual player know that you're there to improve that individual and develop them as a footballer to become a better footballer. Mm. And it takes a lot more time uh, for a coach, or in particular if you are in charge, that you do spend that time building a relationship. Not necessarily, as I said, talking to players about football, but talking to them about every other problem. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's not necessarily only players. Because I think uh, in, in, in an environment, it's about speaking to and having that relationship with the staff as well. And you know that a lot of coaches do travel abroad and take their, 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 their team of staff. But a lot of times you go into environments where you've also got staff, existing staff that was there. And that happened even at Pegs Buller, which was a, a big experience to me, being my first experience in a European club. And obviously now at national team level. And how do you bring these people to go along that journey with the existing coaching staff to, to achieve greatness within the team. Because, you know, there's everywhere there's a different culture, there's a different way of doing things. And even as coaches, we have to sort of adapt to that culture, but at the same time put in mechanisms and, and processes that we think mm. will improve the team and help everyone, whether it's, you know, the people that work around uh, the footballers and the footballers themselves. Yeah, so you, you, you've talked a lot about a lot of topics, but really what you're talking about is trying to create a culture or an environment so that w that great team can flourish. So, so these, are, these tend to be like now abstract concepts. If you can break it down for, for, for the, the lay person, what are some of the things that you, you talk about internally with John Van Sheep or the other people in your, in your, how do you know, how do you know if you've got a good culture? Yeah, you, yeah, you can see behaviours and process that exist and how people go about their work, whether they're the footballers or the, the, the staff that are already existing. And you can see how they, yeah, a process of, for example, uh, how they go about the recovery after a game. What are the processes in place? In Holland, it was a little bit different. Didn't mean it was a bad culture, but they did things a little bit old school, and you know we we had to change that. Or it could be in terms of how the players behave within the environment. How do they prepare for training? How do they, you know, sit around at meal time? And how do they interact? And how what is their body language like and their behaviour like? And, yeah. Again, there's many stories. I don't have to be obviously careful about yeah, of course. talking about that. Yeah. But you, you realise very quick uh -huh. in terms of if, if an environment is, is not good or you know, if it just needs a bit of uh, uh, a change. Mm. Um, and generally, I think it's 100% yeah, it's, it's people do make environments and cultures, I think. But in terms of creating that environment and that culture, I think there, there does has to be there, there does has to have uh, uh, rules in place that help uh, a team and players and staff know processes that have to happen, and they are related to the way you want to play football and the way you want your environment. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, and I know that you know I used to read about it as well, and I just used to think, okay, they're, they're just words, and you have to really have values that you believe in as a leader. Okay. And, and I really think those values, they can get banded around like just words that you can put on a wall. Mm. And as, as a younger coach, I saw that and I felt that. And you tried to do things um, that, you know, people said put words up that you believe in and, you know, everyone's going to abide. But they don't. People don't. Mm. Mm. What it comes to is they've got to be values that you truly believe in as a leader. Mm. And that you show through the way you behave as a leader that they are the values you truly believe in. To be able to install them in your staff or your players and to be able to put them within your environment that everyone slowly starts to believe in and act within those values. And those values uh, don't just drive how you want the environment to behave and the sort of people you want in your environment, but they also help in a lot of the decision-making process. Which, okay. you know, often got to learn now as I've become a little bit more experienced and, and, and spending a lot more time in, in, uh, in, in men's football, they, you've really got to believe in these values and they're values that you're going to stick to and they're going to drive a lot of the decision-making that you take because let's face it, we make some really big decisions as coaches 
that a lot of times affects people's livelihoods, a lot of times affect our team and maybe a result. And a lot of times, you know, people on the outside, whether it's the media or uh, a supporter, won't understand why that decision was taken. But mm. when you stick to your values and you really believe in those values and live by them, they generally make the right decisions for you moving forward. Okay. What would you say would be your, your top three values? My top three would be, number one would be uh, humility. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to have humility to always uh, improve and to want to be better. And, you know, even in times of when you're winning and you're having success, that you're low key and you're always looking at how it can be better, mm -hmm. even during that. And even when we lose, that we are able to understand that we're respectful that we did lose, but then find why we lost. And I think you need to be, you need to have that humility within the group and the humility that, you know, we're, we're, in, we're a team. And I believe a lot in, in being, having that team spirit and always putting the team before the individual. Okay. And I think you can see a lot of examples of, of players within a team and you're quickly able to, to filter out the ones that are not about the team and they're about themselves. And then I guess you have to, you have to gorge how much you're able to bring that player towards the team and to mm -hmm. use his qualities or her qualities to help the team become better and bring him amongst the team. Maybe something like, uh, you know, recently we, we, we saw the Jordan documentary and we saw mm -hmm. how, how well that was done by one of the greatest coaches. Or at some point, if that individual won't do that, then can you have that individual in the team? And are his qualities going to be enough to help that team progress? Um, yeah, humility, team spirit, and I believe a lot in, um, in, in hard work, even though I think it's like a prerequisite in, in anything you do. Um, I believe that, you know, with hard work, you can change a lot of things. You've got to be willing to get on with it and, and, and really even during circumstances that are difficult, you've got your idea, you've got your plan, you keep on that path and you just keep working through it. And you, and you work hard non-stop, you're going to work hard for your teammate because you've got that humility and, and you will work hard for your teammate. You will not stop running for them because you put your team first. I think all those sort of mesh into, yeah, and, and, and mesh together and, and make sure that you've got that sort of environment that uh, will help you as a coach as well make those decisions. Does a player work hard enough? Mm. Maybe that's the reason why I won't pick him. Uh, does he have humility within the group? Mm. Is he respectful? And they help you guide mm. the sort of people you want in your environment to create that culture. So you're talking about like rules and a, like a framework and guidelines and your own values. How, how strict are you on, on those observing your own framework so that your team knows where the sort of the edge of the box is? Yeah, I think you have to be very, very strict and you have to be um, very strict. I don't mean like uh, you sit there and you're whipping and you're a dictator. I think rules are normal rules. Rules are, are rules that you would have with your kids and your family. All you want, and this is sometimes I like when John Van Skip says, it is normal rules that are what you expect from, from people around you all the time. So you're not putting rules in place where, you know, the, it's not a norm. The normal thing, like being on time. <laughs> if you're on time, you're also respectful. That means mm. you've got humility in putting the team mm. uh, before yourself. You're not just saying, oh, I'll turn up whenever I want to a team meeting or yeah. I'll, I'll start eating dinner before my teammates come. You know? And if you then reflect upon your values, they're going to drive those rules anyway because mm. they're normal rules. It's normal behaviour that you expect okay. from people. Yeah. You know, again, not, not the sort of rules that, are gonna, uh, can I say, be uh, dictatorial and you're a yep. dictator. Yeah. No, just normal things. And sometimes I think even players within a group. Uh, Please themselves. Put, I think, yeah. I think so. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Brisbane Lions team that, that won the three, what, what, um, what was sort of passed down through the leadership group was. The, the players started policing themselves of what the, the, the expectations of the team were. 
right? And so the coaching part staff could step back because they lived and breathed it amongst themselves. And so you could see how they performed um, on the yeah. AFL stage. Right, and I think you get to that stage by, by being on top of these simple, normal things that you expect from the beginning. Because you'll find that you go into teams and there are, there's always one or two that try to see, well, can we get away with it? Can I be late? Or I don't have to do this because I'm, I'm so-and-so. You get that. But if you're on top of it from the beginning and over time they see that you don't waver on these things, you are strict on them because you're guided by your values and you believe these normal things have to be done properly, the players will start policing it themselves because... Mm-hmm. They see value and they see that you, okay. you know, you, you, you're not going to change on this. And I think that that's what we want to do as leaders, that mm. the, the players and the staff themselves are all in an environment where one day I don't need to be around to say, you have to do this, you have to do that. They have that environment where they expect that normality. And at the same time, even from a football perspective, and we're talking about philosophy, that we coach in a way that we do come become a little bit on the outside and we don't have to coach much because they can coach themselves because our game model is clear, our way of play is clear and we have put everything in place in training that they have an understanding. So to me, yeah, I'm, I'm become a big believer in, and I remember having to write a, what my philosophy was for my A licence in Australia and uh, for my pro licence and everything was about football and how I want to see football play. But when I've rewritten it now, and I remember the, the guys then back at the course, Kelly Cross and uh, mm. what's the, the guy that recently left, which was fantastic as a technical director. I, I've just got a mind blank. That's okay, yeah. Um, so. yeah he, um, they said it's always going to evolve. And yep. It's always going to it's going to be round about the same, but you'll evolve. It has evolved. It's become more of a life philosophy now than okay. just a people philosophy. Because I really believe without those, those life values and, and knowing what you want in life and how you want people to act normally in life, you won't achieve the football mm. perspective either. And I think both my life philosophy now and my football philosophy interact okay. that I'm able to achieve things from uh, that and players are able to achieve things personally and as a footballer through that philosophy. You touched on it in your, in your, when you were talking about the previous question about sort of exceptions to the rule and i wanted to really uh, double click on how do you handle conflict i mean you know throughout um throughout uh you know i've played football ever since uh, i was you know under the age of 10 and, and now in my 40s and i still have a kick in old boy side and you're never going to get along with all your teammates and you're never going to always have a, a perfect dressing room and and, and as a coach you're always going to, you know, conflict is inherent in human interaction. So how do you handle serious conflict? What, what, are the, what, are the, what are the things that you put in place if you have to step into a situation about handling um, conflict within a team? Yeah, look, it, and it, I think it depends what sort of conflict it is. Is it of a football nature? Is it of a personal nature? And for one, I think a lot of the conflict and if, if we talk about a simple conflict of uh, a player having a misunderstanding with another player on the pitch yep. and it comes down to uh, not understanding one's role or the game model, then instantly then I have a problem because I haven't done a job as a coach. It's communication then is the problem, right? So, so I think that uh, those problems can be completely eliminated out of a team by having a clear philosophy, a clear game model, and a methodology that, and a communication process, whether it being, you know, how you teach the players mm. that, that game model and that game plan, that through training, you eliminate all that okay. error that could, have, could occur. And when it does, and there is a conflict, if I have a clear game model, that is always my reference point to, to fix that conflict. Okay. okay? And during the process of building a team, these players, that's what I'm saying, we can become redundant because they understand the game model, they okay. understand the football. Yeah. And they'll be able to say, hey, we're supposed to be second post when that ball is delivered, for example. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and let's say the left winger, the ball's been crossed from the right side, he's not at the second post and the rule is that he has to be. Well, it's clear within the game model what I expect in that situation that 
they're able to coach themselves mm. and they put up their hand and say yes. Or, uh, so, so for me, from that perspective, from a football perspective, it, that's why it is so important during your coaching process that you do have a clearly defined philosophy, mm. a very clear game model, and you go through the process of understanding in the four moments of football exactly what you want okay. from your team, data. Not as a collective only, but then even from an individual. Because when a player turns around and says, yeah, but I wasn't sure whether to do this or that, you're able to clearly define to him through the game model that mm. this is what I expect, this is why I expect it. And then he can improve and get better. And, and you fix that and you eliminate a lot of these conflicts within the pitch. And if, if I go back in my career, and, uh, and I think the game has evolved a lot when, when we used to play, I think that was one of the major issues in those days. Is because there weren't always clearly defined game models, or I think you know twenty. Go out and score. Years, Go out yeah, and look, score. I've selected the best eleven players. You know, you've done a bit of training and training. I expect that you know they're good enough. They're going to win the game. Mm. I looked at how we used to prepare for set pieces in my day compared to now, just set pieces, and how much work goes into set pieces, and and how much work goes in during the building process of of teaching. And developing these players to learn a game model mm. and the process we go through to do it. That was it. Like, you know, sometimes I, I speak to ex teammates or now coaches as well, and we think, geez, whiz, that would have been great if we had that sort of coaching, you know, 20 <laughs> yeah. years ago. So the game has evolved a lot. And imagine where it's going to be in 20 years' time, you know? Mm, mm, mm. So that's, that's eliminating football conflict. But then when we, we're, we're talking from a personal you, I think I answered it before, and that is my values will drive how I'm going to you know, solve that problem. Mm, mm. That, so, that so, would be the drive behind what my decisions. So, so if I can say back how, what, how I've understood what you're saying is if you understand yourself and your values, and that will govern how you act, interact in that situation of conflict as you're guiding. 100%. Okay. 100%. And it comes down to... And I think we evolve as people, we learn. And, you know, I've been, I, I look at it now and I look at the last 10 years of coaching and how much I've changed as a coach. And, you know, like I said before, how I look at the game and now how I look at what coaching is and the effect you can have on a coach as a coach on a person's life, not only football. And, uh, yeah, I think you have to really know yourself and you have to go through that post, process of finding out about yourself and what is it that, that drives you, what is it that makes you the person you are to help people and your environment become better mm. and use that as a vehicle to, you know, to help you play the football you want to play. Yep. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have that environment, if you don't have that culture where you know, the, the culture you want to get the best out of people, it doesn't matter what philosophy of football you have, I don't think you'll achieve it. Mm. Mm. So, again, so it goes back down to people. So, I mean, uh, uh, I did, uh, I did the, I've only completed the C license, but I, I did it with, with one of your ex teammates. Uh, um, I, I don't know if you remember, uh, if you cross paths uh, at, at South, uh, Steve Isafidis. Uh, okay. did, did he play uh, in amongst the similar time frame as you? Or no, just... no he, he played for South. Uh, later on, after I'd moved uh, to Greece. Okay, so he was all right. Moving. So he, he was talking about that, you know, we need, you need to, like, uh, he coaches at a higher level than I do, but he was talking about patterns of play. So how does that, and, and, and I take it, like, you know, I see substitutions when I, when I, when I sit on the sidelines for just a substitute to come on and that folder comes out and all the, the pages yeah. are flipped and, and I sit bamboozled there as a, as a soccer fan and as a soccer coach if all these things are drummed in, what are you guys doing at that like last minute? Yeah, okay. yeah look, uh, because you've always got plan A, plan B. Okay. But then, you know, you, you prepare for set pieces, let's say set pieces, and they could be so, you know, and I've had to do that, especially in Adelaide, that was my role, and it was, uh, you've got to be quick to think because, you know, you've organised, let's say it's a defensive set piece, they're mostly the ones we go through okay. when we're making the change because you know, that, that could affect what could happen. It could affect the result. So you're sitting there and you're going, okay, I've had this tall guy marking their best header. I've got this guy marking okay. him. I've got now you take one person out and it could and, be... Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, because a lot of times you might have the discussion on the bench here, but you're taking him out, but he's helping us with set pieces or they cross the ball in a lot and we're going to lose height. You know, it's amazing the sort of discussions okay. you have to have on the So then, you know, the coach demands that, no, he's got to come off and we're bringing in this short guy mm. who's going to give us this when we have the ball, but then in set pieces, you might have to change a few things around or you might decide, no, I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to make a complete change. It depends on the opposition. Okay, all right. And it, and sometimes these talks on the halfway line aren't necessarily telling him too much information because a lot of these players, you know, from halftime onwards, they're already checking out all this info mm. and they're looking at what type of things we want and they've already looked at it before the game. I might send a message and say, Sasha, you're coming on for John. Mm. You need to be ready. Have a look at what John's doing. Okay. Because it, sometimes it's, it's crazy that you might concede a goal from a set piece when you shouldn't. And it's come because of a change that's happened and the players don't know what's going on. And a lot of times you have to give information to that player coming on to tell him, share that information with your teammates so they know exactly what the change is. Hey, I mean, so, I mean, right now I see Greece sort of at the, at the similar level of football of Australia where the expectations, um, you know, uh, I think, let's be honest, it's, it, you know, both Australia and Greece, it's, it's not Spain or Germany or Argentina or Brazil where, where it's a given that you're probably going to end up in the later group stages. So, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you handle um, expectations versus reality of, you know, an Australia could miss a World Cup, right? Yeah. Where, where, yeah. And, and with, with no disrespect, I mean, Greece... You know, in in your qualifying uh, situations, could miss a Euro or could miss a World Cup. What what? How do you handle those expectations versus reality of what it is that you're de dealing with? That's a very good question. A really good question, uh, and, and especially there's an expectation because back in 2004 they did win the Euro, um, and up until 2010. They were doing very well, even in the FIFA ranking, they're in the top 10. Mm. So, you know, in the last uh, six, seven years, they've fallen behind. And that is also a case of, you know, sometimes when things are going well, how are we looking at improving things instead of getting into a comfort zone? Mm. And I think uh, Greece got into a bit of a comfort zone in 2010, 2012. They had extremely good players playing in very good leagues all over the world, but the mm -hmm. results weren't there and they did not have the success they had in the, in the early 2000s. So the people's expectation is still very high mm -hmm. and we're in a country where it's the number one sport. So when you don't get a result, they'll smash you and you can't mm -hmm. it. And even for us coming in and saying that we're going to change the way we want them to play and become a little bit more attacking and a pressing side, made at the beginning and I'm Greek and I, I can read and write and, and, and I understand it. We're you know getting, what the papers are saying. You know what the papers yeah, are saying. Yep. We're criticised big time because they did not believe Greeks can play this sort of football. But there's a lot of talent here. Of course. A lot of talent. And of you course. find a lot, of, a lot of our talent as well. Um, there's a lot of good academies, especially the big clubs have got fantastic academies and they invest a lot. But a lot of their players... They invest a lot, but they don't actually play them in their first teams, but they actually get fed out to Holland and Germany, and which is a good thing as well because they're playing in really good leagues and they end up playing, getting a lot of good experience. And I think that for too long, uh, Greece had their own philosophy, not necessarily uh, a football philosophy, but a philosophy in terms of how you pick players and what type of players. And slowly, I think we've been trying to change this. So you, know, you hear some stuff, even when you speak to academy people here sometimes, that you know, they've, they've got an idea of what a centre-back looks like. Okay. Centre-back has got to be this tall, this strong, and we're saying, no, we don't worry about the height, we don't worry about this, we worry about ball and how they play okay. and that they're able to defend. You know what I mean? So they're the sort of things you're trying to change and the mindset's changing. And you can see that the more talented players you're playing and the more different type of player you're bringing into the team, their mentality is changing as well, which is great. So I noticed back in November after our good results and our, forget our results, our really good performances, everyone just changed the way they viewed the game. And I thought, wow, this is exciting now. Ever since then with lockdown, with uh, 
coronavirus thing, we've, we've cancelled some really, really good games and people are just waiting okay. to watch that thing, which that hadn't happened for a long time. So, you know, I think the way we have to change things is one, the process we put in place in terms of development. And you're saying that we're, we're on equal par with Australia in terms of what you said with the question. I mean, yeah. We are a little bit. The talent here is there's far more talent. There's no doubt about it. And the reason is it's number one sport and everyone grows up playing this sport. Mm-hmm. Okay? So the first thing they do is play football, where in Australia we play everything else and football. And that's a different philosophy as well, whether you think that helps or not. But I think that in a development point of view, and I think it was a problem in Australia as well. A lot of things are isolated and we have to help players with decision-making processes a lot earlier. Okay. So we can have uh, like a, a skill ruse program and we can isolate and teach skills. But I think you can teach a lot of those skills within game, a game context okay. and real game situations. And I think we do need more of that. And in Greece as well, I think more of that is needed as well at a younger age, even though we do develop good talent. But I'm saying, how do you maximise and develop okay. more talent? Yeah. Okay. Because I think I'm talking about Greece now. They can do a lot more. Um, but uh, I think that, yeah, there's, there's got to be one, a, a clear philosophy being put in place by the Federation, which they're doing that now, hmm. that national teams play a certain way, that coaches are coached a certain way and are taught certain things to improve the football. A little bit of what I think Australia did 10 years ago. Yep. I'm, I'm a little bit critical not of what was done. I'm a little bit critical sometimes of people complaining that it wasn't good what was done. Yeah. Because I think something had to be done. And at the time, you know, we, we complained about the Dutch or Hamburger. He put something in place yep. that didn't exist. And at that time, that worked. What I'm disappointed with, Sasha, is that since then, they've moved on. Mm-hmm. It is what it is, still after years. But where did we, as an Australian Federation, call in eight, ten, four, whatever it is, of our best coaches mm-hmm. with the most experience, not only in development, but working overseas and having a look how it's done, mm-hmm. to come in and say, right, how can we improve this body of work, this foundation that we've got? Mm, mm. Take far too long and make it okay, Australian, if you want to call it. Yep. Let's see where it's gone wrong, where it's gone right. And I think even that's happening a little bit now here because for far too long, you know, they were just. Rehagel came in in 2004, won the 2004 European Championships playing miracle, a certain way. Miracle, miracle. Counter attacking. And then they thought, that's it, we're going to win all the time doing that. <laughs> Right. Teams work you out, right? Teams work yeah. you out. Yeah. Yeah. And and at the same time, we've suppressed uh, players' ability to be able to play a different way in this country because they are technical, they're quick, they want to play football, and we've suppressed them saying, no, you can only play this way. The great. And then we create like a mentality that no, we can't do that, mm. and we start believing that. It, it's amazing. And it's a little bit like, like in Australia, I remember back in 2010, when everything was put in place to start coaching coaches to be more proactive, for Australian players to be more proactive. You know, you hear people saying, oh, only in Barcelona you can do that. I don't, I don't believe that. That I do not believe. Because I've been able to witness it as an example working in Adelaide and what was achieved with the Adelaide United team, with, with uh, Joseph Gambao, Guillermo Amor, Paul yep. Martin and myself there, what we did with the youth teams and how many players were developed. Yep. from the youth teams in that era and then even at Melbourne City the way we played and and you can see and even okay let's not talk about that but even what Ange Postecoglou will do with Brisbane yep. so yep. Yep. those players from Barcelona no and that's where you know I might have romanticised back then and I, and I loved what Ange had done with Australian football and even what he'd done with the national team but there is still that belief that we can't do it that way and, okay. and I don't believe it yes it can be more Australian if you have a look at uh, what Guardiola did with, with, with Bayern Munich, mm. it wasn't Barcelona, but it was a Barcelona prototype with a German quality. Yep. Yep. So to play that sort of football, we don't have to have uh, boys and girls from a Barcelona academy or that they only make them in Spain. It's the way they coach them and what methodology they use 
to prepare and to be able to play that way. Mm. And I think that's where we really have to focus on okay. at a younger age, whether it be here or in Australia. Mm. And even I read a lot of articles, the same problem in, in the United States. It's what coaching happens down below to develop that, that type of player. I don't know if I've gone off track a little bit. No, 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 yeah, no, no. Very, very good. So enthralling. So this, this is this is perfect. I think if you could sort of sum up, right? Um, what advice do you have for, to to learning coaches? So I think we're all on a learning journey. It's obvious that you said you've developed. So I think you're you're still on your your learning journey, and it probably continues. You never stop learning. Okay. You never stop learning, and even even till today. I always look to learn and, you know, you watch the Champions League games and, and you watch coaches and you're continuously looking at, okay, what, how are they thinking? Why are they doing this? Uh, how can you use it? I'm not saying that you can take something from a coach and just put it in your team. Mm. You've got to be able to know these are the qualities of my players. This is my team. This is my game model. How can I use this within my team? Or, you know, great coaches, can you can learn from them because they give you ideas that you can help complement your players or mm -hmm. help improve your players. But, you know, some of these guys are out of this world. And you know, we know in the last decade what, what Pep Guardiola has done. But then, you know, when, when I went on the track of looking at what he was doing and trying to learn at what was driving him and how he made his team play that way, yeah, I was lucky enough, and I say it all the time, and I'm grateful enough, that it's amazing how the universe works sometimes. And I had Joseph Gambal, Guillermo Amor, and Paul Marti land on my on my on my mm. lap in Adelaide. Mm. And these guys from Barcelona were able to teach me a hell of a lot of mm. what I was seeing this great guy do with Barcelona, changing the world of football. But then you go on a track where you look at a coach and then you start reading what what they've been focusing on and who they've been studying, and you go on a track and, and it's a great journey to develop yourself and keep developing yourself. And you look at a lot of young German coaches now and what they're doing and, and you know, you, there's a lot you can learn. There's a lot you can learn with teams with the way they set up and how they want to attack or how they want to build up from the back. You know, in the last six months, whatever it is, we've had the new rule that, you know, the, the defenders can come in during the goal kick. Yes. It's been great to have a look at, okay, how that who does that come from? Yeah, and it changes the game because it complements more the team now that wants to play out and it changes things for the teams, you know, that are pressing. So they're the sort of things that you can never stop learning. And, and I think um, I look at it from a personal point of view. I have a clear philosophy. I want the game played in, in a certain way. And I always look to learn and, and watch what some of these coaches that have got a similar philosophy do because you, you learn all the time. You can never say you know everything. Never or else you'll, you'll just remain stale and you'll stay where you are. So that, that's the most important thing for young coaches. But in terms of your question as well, I think, you know, you've got to be, especially when you're young, Stash, is, is try things. Mm. Try things. Mm. And, and, and see what works and be innovative and really think about the game. One of my hardest pet hates is, especially at young ages, when the coach thinks it's all about him. Mm. and it's not about the players and you know he thinks he's the next Mourinho and mm. the team has got to win for him mm. I think the driving force should be that you know you're trying to make each player better you're trying to improve every player that your team improves that your team through performance starts getting results and as people will improve in that environment and slowly yes I as a coach will also get the, the recognition of the work I'm doing because especially at young ages it's so important that and that, that is a problem, isn't it? That coaches focus so much on themselves and where they're going to get to that we're forgetting at developing the individual. And sometimes at these young ages, we find that there's a super talented player mm. and we think, yeah, he's going to make it. But sometimes there's a diamond. It could mm. be six out of ten. Mm. And he's got a tremendous attitude. And he we're needs... Right. We're right. We're yeah. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of times I've seen whether I was involved in the youth or my personal experience as a player being in some really good youth teams at South Melbourne and that, that, it's not always that super talent that goes on and makes it. Sometimes it is that kid that six out of 10 has got the attitude and he's working really hard day in, day out. And you know, within two or three years, he makes that leap mm. and he goes on and makes it. So we have to be really careful as coaches. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a big responsibility being a coach. And even in those young teams, I think it's about uh, preparing, 
preparing to have sessions that teach, that the kids learn in every session they learn, in every session they have fun, and in every session they work hard. And they don't even realise they work hard because they're having fun and they're learning. Okay. And that is really important. And, and for me, uh, for young coaches, and this comes a little bit of what I believe in, Sash, that every exercise, and this is a little bit of my own book that's coming out, every exercise should have the component. Every exercise has got to do with the game model. It's got to do with what, how you're teaching them to play. It's got to have the component, the full performance factors of technical, tactical, physical, and mental. Mm-hmm. And so those, they can't be separate. And as soon as you see an exercise that doesn't have all those four, then there's a problem. And to me, I like to say that if I'm going to do an exercise, and there's a reason why I'm doing an exercise as a coach, those four components, I will have a reason and an explanation for all those four. So even when I'm coaching, even from a mental point of view, how many times do coaches look at the mental aspect of an exercise? Mm. I don't think too many. I think maybe a senior football. I think a lot of times, you know, we look at, okay, the technical and sometimes the tactical. Mm. Sometimes we separate those two. And that's where I'm saying we can improve decision-making by always having those two together, not eliminating technical separately. And then the physical, Mm. that is my biggest pet hate when I see coaches just run kids Mm. without the ball. That is absolute nonsense that I'm going to get my players fit, especially young kids, without the ball. The ball should always be incorporated in every practice. And all those four performance factors, you should have a good think about the exercise and say, right, from um, a technical perspective, I'm focusing on this, from a tactical, that I'm helping my team understand, okay, we're building up from the pack, what are the things we're working on in the exercise? And then from a physical perspective, okay, with younger kids, it's a little bit different, but then when we're talking 16, 17 years of age, Depending on the size of the pitch, the dimensions, the number of players, we can either be working on endurance or we're working on uh, uh, repeated sprints or Mm. or power, whatever that is. So we know physically what we're working on. And then from mental, it could be that I'm going to focus on, for example, that, you know, as soon as we, when we have the ball, we're going to keep it in the back. We're building up, but we're keeping it because that's the way of defending. And we're not going to lose it and not to be afraid of that. Because how many times you see in a game, you're winning 1-0. And, and I've seen it whether I was in Australia or whether I'm here in Greece sometimes. You watch young kids play. And because they're winning 1-0, and there's the last five minutes, coaches are shouting, just kick it along, just get it out. Why? why? And why can't we train that? that? That the kids get the confidence and the belief in themselves that we can keep the ball. We don't have to just hoof it long and then go and defend because we're winning 1-0. That sort of thing. That's where you can train Chain, uh, train a little mental example. So this is this has been a brilliant conversation. I can I can tell the passion that uh, exudes. I can I can I now know the reason why you've made football your life. So the the um, so I think this is going to be inspirational uh, to many um, uh, novice coaches like myself that are that are learning and trying to improve. So um, I want to thank you very, very much um, for your time uh, today, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope uh, the people who watch this uh, video back get as much enjoyment out of it as I did t- today. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ash. Thanks for the opportunity. Like I said, I love uh, talking football. It is my life. It is my life. You know, from a young kid, um, I dreamt that I'd be a, a, a professional footballer one day. and you know, I achieved that. And, you know, going to Greece was like a, a dream of mine, having a Greek heritage and being a Greek background. And once I stopped playing, and it was even a time, you know, when I was about 27, just before I left Greece, I really thought about coaching and I always wanted to, to become a coach. And it was the time when I started taking a lot of notes and thinking about coaching. But again, it was all about football mm-hmm. back then. And I always knew that, that coaching, I'd probably do better in coaching than as a player. Okay. Because the player, I know for a fact, and that's why I believe in kids that work hard. As a player, I wasn't God's gift to football. And what I mean, I didn't have those super skills uh, that you could say, this kid is amazing. I had to work harder. 
and I trained hard and I worked extra and I worked on my weaknesses and, and thank God I had some really good coaches that believed in me and helped me achieve my dreams and that's what we have to do as coaches, especially at young ages, you know, help the kids achieve their dreams. That's leadership and that's what we are, we're leaders. And later on, when I, when I started coaching, I've been really grateful to work with some really good people that have given me tools and helped me and uh, get this wealth of knowledge and to be able to, to even work now where I'm working. And it, it's, I'm grateful to all those people. But we never stop learning and we keep dreaming big and we keep working hard towards our dreams. And if you really believe in something, you really love it, you just keep going. You keep going because I know sometimes even in Australia, and I'm going a little bit longer here, even in Australia, it can become uh, really tough for young coaches. It can become overwhelming and you think because there's not many opportunities to coach at the highest level. You know, there's no second division. Uh, there's not that many teams in the A-League. And you'd really love to work at a professional environment that gives you the resources and the ability to to, to prove yourself and show. But you need to keep going. And yep. you need to make the best of your own environment that you're in. And you need to find ways, ways of creating that environment that it becomes as professional as you can. Mm -hmm. So even in my time when I was in Adelaide and I was in the youth team and I was in charge of creating that environment with the youth team, in the mornings I was working with the senior team, in the afternoon with the youth, don't think that we had budgets to create super environments. But we had to think out of the square. We had to... To, to do all the things we wanted to do, and credit to all the people who worked around me, you know, we thought out of the box and we created an environment that gave the best resource to the kids to, to be able to achieve their dreams. And you can do it. And even now, as you travel, and this is why I'm saying it, don't think that it's all rosy and greener on the other side and you've got budgets that are out of this world. You have to think out of the square sometimes mm. to, to get the resources you need within the environment to help your players. And that's why it's a huge learning curve. So, you know, don't put yourself down. Work hard. Work hard at it. Create that environment. And I believe that, you know, the world, the way it works, when you love what you're doing and when you really work hard at what you're doing and that's what you really want to do, a door will open and there'll always someone will show up that will give you that opportunity. You've just got to keep going and, stop and never stop believing. Well, again, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. I wish you all the very best um, in your time there. Uh, please give our regards to uh, Mr. Van Ship and the rest of the well, fantastic, yeah. fantastic players all the way from Melbourne, Australia. So, Mike, Michael, have a good uh, rest of your day. Yeah, good, day. Yeah, good, good stuff. Mate. Thank you so much. All the, best. all the best with everything. Thank you. Thank you.